Gómez lanza en el dentro del área y volaba bola, Gabriel. Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arscast Extra, as always, with James from Gunnerblog. James, after what seems a very long time, goodly morning to you. Yes, goodly morning. Uh, the dry spell is over. The first goodly morning of 2024. Wow. The year starts now. <laughs> it's good. About time, I say. That guy who hates goodly mornings, he's had a good run. Yeah. But his year just fell apart yeah, over the course of this weekend. He, he's turned off right now. By now, he's already switched off, hasn't he? So we can... Yeah. Well, he, he won't download it today. He'll know what's coming. He'll know. <laughs> He'll be like, those two clowns, they're going to say it. Yeah, but do, we you, are. but do you not think he's he's like one of those people who go, I hate this so much, but I'm still going to listen? Maybe. Maybe. Do write in if you are listening, man. Do write in. Yeah. But... We'd love to hear to, from you. <laughs> to the, <laughs> but to the rest of you, the very good list of mornings. 5-0 yes. to the Arsenal. 5-0. Can't complain about that, I don't think, after a, a we'll period try, of not We'll scoring. find a way somewhere along oh, the line, yeah. I'm sure. No question. Should have been With 10. football fans, Andrew. Yeah, well, that's just, that's just how it works. That is how it works. Look, you know, we ticked a lot of boxes in, in this particular game. I think... Uh, yeah. There were concerns at the top end of the pitch, of course, that we weren't scoring goals. There were concerns that we were a bit leaky at the back as well. So three points, clean sheet, five goals. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. I do think we probably need to offer our um, thanks to Crystal Palace for a pretty spectacularly limp performance, I thought. Mm. But certainly, you know, we still had to do the job. And we did it with some efficiency. Correct. Correct. Yeah, they, they weren't good. Um, when I did the preview podcast with our, our pal Dan from HLTCO, he was not at all confident that the Palace would be able to get something out of this game. I don't think he was expecting uh, them to ship five goals, but um, he didn't think that uh, a positive result was forthcoming from, from their perspective. And you know what? He was right. Yeah. And there's a lot going on at that club, obviously. Um I don't know if we got this in the preview podcast, but he was telling me there's quite a bit um, happening at, at sort of board level, ownership level. The the sort of main guy who's got like 45% of it, the Steve Parrish, of course, who owns some of the club. But there's this sort of boardroom stasis and financial issues. And, and as Arsenal fans, I think we can recognize how that can manifest itself on, on the pitch with all the best intentions of the players and Roy Hodgson and coaching staff. You know, things, if they're not right at the very top of the club, can uh, become very apparent on the pitch, can't they? And maybe that was part and parcel of what was going on with, with Palace yesterday and and you know, the run that they're on at this moment in time. I think it's one win in 12. Yeah, I think there's a bit of drift there mm. you know, in terms of how the club's being managed. Um, and, I, and I have to be honest, I, I'm slightly surprised Roy Hodgson is still in the job. Uh Today, I mean, not because he's 76 or whatever he is, but because I thought this might be his last Crystal Palace match and I mm. partly expected him to be dismissed after the sort of nature of that scoreline and the way the players seem to, in the second half at least, really kind of capitulate and slightly throw in the but, towel. But, but what are they going to do? Are they going to sack Roy Hodgson, then hire Roy Hodgson again to take over from Roy Hodgson to save them from relegation? Is that Well, if they, can't, if they don't sack him, Andrew, how are they going to rehire him? That's the question. That's it. That's it. Um, but yeah, listen, those are Palace's problems for now. Um, they are. Uh, from an Arsenal perspective, this was exactly what was required, really. Like you say, problem scoring goals, a bit leaky at the back. Sold both of those. Mm. Looked much tidier, much more confident, like a much happier camp. And now back to 
Back to the sunbeds, I guess. I mean, they've got, you know, what is it, nine to ten days before they play again. That's right, yeah. Next Tuesday when we go to to Nottingham Forest. Um, so, yeah, some time off, and maybe that might be actually a good thing because there were a couple of injuries in this game, which we'll we'll talk about a bit later on, I guess. Mm. Arteta gave them three days off, I think, after the Palace match. So they had Sunday, Monday and Tuesday to do what they will. Ben White will be back to Dubai and tanning again uh, in that short window of time. And then they return to training on Wednesday. Will he not just go down to his local Mr. Sun tanning salon or whatever? He's got one in the basement, mate. Come on. Oh, he does as well, of course. Of course. He sleeps there. It's like he's <laughs> like a vampire. Like a vampire, coffee. except Ben White goes to bed in the sunbed every night. <laughs> he's the opposite of a vampire. He has to be exposed to UV at all times. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, so, look, let's talk starting lineup. There were a couple of changes from the from the last time we played. Gabriel Jesus was back in the team. Alexander Zinchenko back in the team. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Leandro Trussard, Trussard started. started, which I didn't know if that was necessarily 100% a you know, a selection decision, a tactical decision. I think Mikel Arteta said afterwards that Gabriel Martinelli wasn't fully, fully fit. I think that's what he said. Could have fooled me. Um, well, he you know, maybe, maybe he would have fooled you if he'd started the game. True. So, you know, I'm he came on. Fooled. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, that, that was interesting. And... Uh, I mean, you were there. What was what was the what was the mood like? What was the atmosphere like? There was a lot of talk about mm, Arsenal could really do with an early goal here after not scoring. Blah blah blah. Um, what was the sort of level of expectation around the ground when you were there? Yeah, I think people were up for it. I mean, you know, it's been a little while since we played, and uh, especially since we played in the league. And I, I think, yeah, I think the expectation was that we would beat Palace. To be honest, and. I didn't hear any great outcry over the starting eleven. Personally, I thought it was sort of interesting to not play Martinelli. I mean, I just think there's no harm from time to time in not playing, not starting is maybe a better word to use, one of Martinelli or Saka. I think it gives you a great weapon to use Mm. off the bench. In games where you ought to have enough anyway, I you know what? What a wonderful thing with twenty minutes to go to bring on Gabriel Martinelli to run a, a tired, beleaguered Crystal Palace defence, and obviously we saw the benefit of that right towards the end of the game. But yeah. I liked that he mixed it up a little bit, and I think I hope maybe that's a sign that he'll do a little bit more of that moving forward. Because I love Saka, I love Martinelli, I completely understand how important they are, but. Um, I think the reliance on them has been dangerous. And I think to, towards the end of the calendar year, I think we saw maybe that weariness there that maybe was a, a consequence of that reliance, you know? Yeah, maybe so. And and the fact is, you know, Trossard came in and I don't think uh, he's been brilliant over the last few weeks uh, either, to be honest. And he has, you know, played the odd game here and there, um, started left eight a couple of times as well. Mm-hmm. But I guess he is the de facto Martinelli replacement when Martinelli doesn't start Trossard his first pick for that left-hand side. And he was lively enough early on, wasn't he? He got got down the left a couple of times. And um, the early goal that I think we were looking for and or needed mm. settled the nerves of it came from a set piece. And I think set pieces are obviously the... Um, well, not the focus, but certainly some of the focus after, uh, after you know, the two goals in the first half um, and how dangerous we actually were from set pieces in, in this half. There was a lot of analysis on, on match of the day. I don't know if you had a chance to, to look at that. Did you see that? I did, yeah. Deciphering mm. Martin Odegaard's uh, sock grabbing. Yes. Yeah, I mean... <sighs> It's hard to know exactly, you know, how much of what Odegaard was doing with his socks is to do with where the corners are being taken or or what the signals are or how they work the signals out, you know, because there's like everybody in the penalty box looking at Martin Odegaard's socks. Is Bakayo Saka or Declan, are they looking at Martin Odegaard's socks? Um, you know, it's, it's quite subtle in a way um, because it requires a lot of focus and attention from all the players, doesn't it, to know... Which routine they're going to uh, they're going to pull off? But yeah, I think I think there's I don't know if my, uh, match of the day sort of 
cracked the code, as it were. But I think they were in the right ballpark. I mean, Jordan Campbell, uh, my colleague at The Athletic, did a, a a profile on Yeova where he spoke to players he'd worked under him previously and he actually mentioned socks as one of the signals. He was like, you know, sometimes it's socks, sometimes it's something you you touch one boot or touch another boot. The key thing is that these things change throughout the season mm. to avoid detection, right, from opposition analysts and match of the day yeah. pundits. They'll continually shift them it wouldn't surprise me if they change them for example during the dubai break and maybe now the telly have picked up on it they'll change it again so they've got to stay ahead of us and the analysts but there must be some sort of comms it was a really well worked uh routine i really liked you know what they did to kind of free gabrielle on both occasions Mm. and and on that first goal interestingly it was declan rice wasn't it taking the corner yeah yeah i mean Trossard's corners have been a frustration to me. Uh, You know, when Martinelli doesn't play, he's the guy who's out there, so he usually takes them. And I think, Mm. you know, I mentioned this in the blog today, that when you look at how how good we are and how efficient we are and how productive we are from set pieces, you think about some of the games that we play, think about the West Ham game, think about the Villa game, think about the, uh, the Fulham game, where we really did not make the most of our set-piece opportunities in those games Mm -hmm. in comparison to yesterday where I think we saw the importance of good delivery into the box. And let's say the Fulham game where you just don't play well, you don't have a great game, collectively you're not brilliant, but, you know, stick in one of those corners or two of those corners during the game rather than having them cleared at the near post and maybe you come away from Fulham with, you know, a point, which, you know, is useful at the end of the day. Or maybe you do enough to get three points. I don't know. But that's why some of that set-piece delivery stuff has been quite frustrating to me over the last few weeks. Because we do have players who can really attack the ball very well. We do have players, um, and a set-piece coach is obviously very effective in doing great work with those players, as the goals tally from set-pieces tells you. So it is a frustration where... You know, you think back to those uh, games and some of the corners, some of the the free kicks that we had, we didn't make the most out of. Yesterday, I think we absolutely did, and we caused Palace all kinds of problems. As you said, Trossard blocking off Anderson. You know, as much as we can talk about how opposition analysts are looking at Arsenal signals or whatever they're going to try and do from these set pieces, it's clear that Arsenal had a look at Crystal Palace and found a way to make them less effective when it comes to defending uh, set pieces. And that was part of that was blocking off uh, uh, Joachim Anderson. Yeah. I mean, Trossard's contributions to the first couple of goals were his best contributions to an Arsenal set piece for some time, really, in terms of making a nuisance of himself in that six yard box. I would have been interested to see had Martinelli started, you know, would he have been taking the corners from the left-hand side? I thought Rice's delivery on this first one is really good. I mean, if he is the best at it, I know he's tall. Yeah. So there's sort of a, a tendency to go, well, put him in the box. But if he really does have the best delivery, let him take them, I say. Like, you know, I, I, it's so important to mm. beat that first man and make something of the opportunity. Um, Did you see the video that was doing the rounds of the uh, the Crystal Palace fans who were – who? Um, were right there at that corner when when Rice was going to take it, and they were going, "Ah, fucking wanker, West Ham reject da 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 da," and then he just whips in a brilliant corner, and <laughs> Arsenal go one nil up. It's very good. I've not seen that, but right. that's very enjoyable, and it, it's a great run and climb from Gabriel. I mean, how many times have we said it? There are few better, I mm. think, and and when you've got a player like that, again, the delivery's got to be so good. Um, because he's such a threat when it is. Mm. The set pieces, I mean, did cause problems. There was one that Palace headed onto onto their own bar as well. Yes. Yeah, that was a uh, slightly was, odd moment. But yeah, very nearly sort of careered into the net. Almost straight away after that one. Um, then what was it? I mean, it, it sort of settled down a bit, the game, didn't it, after that? There was... Um, yeah, and I think any sort of latent anxiety from the fans settled down as well. You know, there was that feeling of, well, we've got we've got the ball in the back of the net at the very least, mm. uh, which is what we've been struggling to do. Uh, but just on that first Gabriel, by the way, Palace, I don't think were happy, were they, with um, 
his climb. Did you have, did you think no. they had any case there? No. I agree. It's a run no. and a jump. It's right? a run and jump, yeah. I think if we're turn it around, you know, if you're if you see an opposition player do that, what would your thought be? Foul or you know, the defending wasn't strong enough. Or the the attacker got the jump on the defender, as can happen, you know. It's mm. it's it's more easy, I think, for an attacker to do that than a than a defender. But I don't see any real foul there. And if that had been up the other end, I would not complain if, if the goal was given. I would, wouldn't want that. Mm. Uh, I would not be able to make a good case for that goal being chalked off. Right. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I'm trying to think what happened next. So they had a shot, uh, I think, from... Who's the guy? Lerma, who, who used to be at yeah. Bournemouth, I think. Raya kicked it out. You know, he had accepted, had a shot, decent enough save. That was kind of the only real first half threat that I recall from them. Yes, I think so. I think so. And uh, our second goal came from uh, another corner. Uh, Bakayo Saka this time taking. Again, there was a, a run to the back post. Um, you could see on TV, actually, maybe it was, I think there was a free kick just before this and they were clearly getting Gabrielle to go back post. Declan Rice told Gabrielle to go to the back post for the free kick, which, o- which Odegaard took and, and Palace got it away. But that was that was obviously a tactic. Um, Saka's delivery was, was excellent. Gabrielle's header was a bit weird, wasn't it? Because he didn't quite celebrate like it was his goal, even though I think it's morally his goal. Um but it goes yeah, down at first a- I was amazed it was given as known goal, but I have seen an angle of it where it kind of looks like it is a chance it might just be going across goal, his header, and the keeper diverts yeah. it in. But yeah, a bit harsh, I thought, to take it off him. Um, he does all the hard work. And, and for all our grievances about the delivery from the opposite side, you know, be it Martinelli or Trossard, I do think Saka is much, much more consistent yes. with his corner kicks. And I actually saw some data during the break about the level of threat from his deliveries from that side. And I think he's right up there in the Premier League uh, when it comes to swinging those corners in. So really good delivery. Mm-hmm. Trossard doing his nuisance thing in the six-yard box again. Gabriel gets free. And suddenly we're two goals up. Who needs open play, Andrew? <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. But I, I think um, I think we also <laughs> needed open play. You know, that's... Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing about this game. I, I, I suppose if, if I was being playing devil's advocate, I might say sort of, did Arsenal unlock uh, the capacity to score goals from open play? Or did their set pieces just start firing again, you know? Maybe a little from column A, a little from column B. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the key thing really is to change the game state, you know, to, to put the game into a position where you get that early goal. I think that's been so the difference in the last few weeks, certainly from this team of this season and last season. Last season, I've, and this is more a feeling, I've not, you know, run the research or anything, but I felt like we got the early goal so often and it opened games up, it put, sort of the power in our hands. And I just think we've struggled to do that of late. And doing that here, you know, I think really, really gave us a, a platform to, to go on and win for it. I do think it's an interesting thing to consider, though, because I'm not saying there's people that dismiss set-piece goals. But a goal is a goal, right? And it doesn't really matter too much how you score them once you're capable of scoring them. Um I thought Arteta's comments yeah. afterwards were, were quite interesting where he was asked on, on what's it called, TNT Sport now, not BT Sport, but TNT Sport. He was asked about practicing set pieces. He said, if we want to be the best team in the world, you have to be the best team at everything you do. We can still do better and we'll continue to work on everything that can make us better. But I thought that was just a really interesting thing to say. Is like, why not maximize every possible uh a chance you have of of scoring a goal and maybe there's a, a touch of snobbery about set piece goals because often they're associated with teams who can't do both things or who mm. who maybe focus 
a lot more on set pieces than scoring from open play because of, a, you know, maybe their stature, maybe the kind of team they are. Maybe they're a team whose best chance of scoring goals does come from set pieces. If, you know, let me just uh, say a Luton versus uh, a Manchester City, right? What's Luton's best chance of scoring a goal against Man City? It's probably from, you know, a set piece rather than pulling Manchester City apart and playing scintillating football, right? So we can all understand it from from that point of view. But, you know, a lot of goals, I think we scored quite a lot of set-piece goals last season too. You know, there were goals from corners, particularly early in the season, right? Am I remembering wrong? Like I can think of the game against against Brentford. Was there a headed goal against Brentford? Um, certainly Fulham, one of, you know, one of the impressive away wins we had against Fulham, there were set-piece goals. So, mm. like, I'm, I think it's common sense to try and be as good as you can be in every aspect of the game um and when you don't maybe when you don't score as many from open play as people might want people think you're you're prioritizing one thing over the other but i'm not sure it's that i don't think it's a question of priority but i i do think if you went back and looked at the teams that have won the premier league i suspect that set piece goals would account for a lower proportion of their goals than ours currently do. Hmm. Um, and I, I, I do think that there may be a sense that, you know, if you're scoring goals from open play as well, that's more a marker of sure. quality and sustainability. But of course they're important. And I think it's excellent that we excel in them. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I joked that we'd find a way to be uh, critical about five to win. <laughs> but I do have the slight, how can I put it? You know, we scored two goals from our corners. We scored one goal from their corner. And then the two in stoppage time are against a team that's like pretty ragged by that point. Mm-hmm. You know, I it, it doesn't necessarily fill me with confidence that Arsenal can now break down a deep block and, you know, play five quick passes on the edge of the box and find a way through. You know, it's not like they were suddenly um, doing that, which they've not hugely done all season long. It was more kind of like the things that were working for us in September, October, November were working for us again. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I mean, maybe that's unfair, but that is sort of like something that is in the back of my head. Here. Sure. I mean, I see that. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, we yeah, it's that versus like, well, we haven't scored for ages and we've won 5-0. Sure, sure, you sure. You know, what do people want? Um, I, I know exactly what you're saying. You know, if you're pulling teams apart, if you're, you know, ripping them to pieces with your scintillating attacking play, you know, that is more eye-catching and it's probably, um, it's probably better uh, overall than uh, not being reliant on set pieces, but it, there's a balance, isn't there, between being really good at set pieces and being reliant mm. on set pieces. And yeah, look, there is something to be said about the two Martinelli goals. Like they, oh, did I favorite a tweet? I think I did if I can find it here. I thought this was quite good. But, you know, the, the two late goals definitely added some gloss. For definitely sure. added some gloss. Um. Yeah, I saw this tweet in reply to something I I posted after the game from Aaron Harris, who's at Aaron Harris, who said, that was the best second gear win I've ever seen. And I kind (laughs) of know what he means because it was like, you know, it was, if it finishes 3-0, you go, pretty routine win for Arsenal. Palace weren't great. Arsenal did what they had to do to win the game. But two Martinelli goals and it's 5-0 and that's a different scoreline. It makes you feel slightly differently about it. But I do know what he means and you know what you're uh, alluding to when it comes to to the overall performance. I just wonder if as a platform to getting towards those kind of performances and that kind of football, what we did on Saturday would be very, very useful. Yeah, no disagreement there. And, and like I say, I almost think, I almost think that those first goals give you that platform. I mean, the Arsenal's third goal is a counter-attacking goal. Do you score that in part because you're two goals ahead and Palace are having to chase a bit, you know, and they maybe gamble and throw one or two more forward than they might do at nil-nil, and it creates that space for you to break into. They I also, think- sorry, they also took off their best centre half. Um, sure. Well, the, Mark Gay came off and and. Um, 
someone's granddad came on. What's his name? Uh, Tompkins. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think there's an element of that to it as well. But I, I think that it's undoubtedly uh, a really good, really healthy win and, and exactly, you know, what was required. Um, but yeah, I, I, I equally can see why there might still be one or two question marks. It's interesting as well. Like I think as someone who was in the stadium, uh, as delighted as everyone was to see those goals go in, and I hate to bang on about this, but I did feel like the VAR element of proceedings really did kind of dampen the euphoria. You know, I, I, every goal, certainly the first three goals, seemed to be met with, you know, a bit of a delay. Uh, and yeah. it, is this going to be given? And, you know, they didn't announce the goal. It's a small thing, but they didn't announce the goal or the goal scorer over the PA immediately. Like, I think the first one, Gabrielle was announced as the goal scorer about three minutes after the game was already underway I noticed again. that, yeah. I mean, I have to say, it didn't come across on TV like there was any doubt with regards right. to the goals. Like, I, we saw, I think we saw Varacek maybe for the second one right. when um, Ben White got off his sunbed to, to block off the goalkeeper. I mean, he look, Ben White can be a bit naughty, can't he? And naughty's mm. the wrong word, but you know what I mean? He sort of can slightly cross the line when it comes to uh, the way he, he stands in front of goalkeepers. And we saw that with the, the goal that was disallowed against Leicester uh, last season. Was it last season? The season before? I can't remember. But yeah, uh, it was last season because it was last Trossard, season, Trossard who, Trossard, yeah. who scored it. Um, but there, there didn't seem to me to be anything in this. And then there was a check for the third goal but, you know, having watched it in real time, I was looking at it going, what are they even doing here? Like, why are they why are they even bothering? It's so clearly onside. I don't understand why, A, they're bothering, or, you know, B, why it's taking so long. So your experience, I think, in the stadium, sometimes you get that on TV where you go, oh, there's something going on here. And you guys in the stadium, of course, are, are, are second-class citizens, I think, when it comes to... Uh, how this stuff works. You know, I remember being at the Sheffield United game earlier this season. It was like, oh, Christ, every goal. So it was like two minutes after every goal before it was officially given, and it was it was really tedious. So I guess it was the same thing. But from where I was watching, it didn't seem that apparent on TV that this was going to be an issue. That's really interesting. And, and, I, and I, I wonder if other fans in the ground felt similarly. I think it's, it's kind of intriguing, even if there was clarity on television. As you say, that sort of tells its own story. I think there was just kind of a bit of uncertainty in the stands, maybe. Maybe it's just a, a function of the fact we've become kind of accustomed to that uncertainty or delay. Mm. You know, it, there's almost a sort of looking at the referee, looking at the officials, trying to figure out if there is going to be a VAR appeal. Um, I know I've just sort of got a, an axe to grind about it slightly, so I, I don't want to labour the point. But I did feel like it maybe took the edge off some of those goal scoring moments mm. just on, on the subject of set pieces. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that palace going into the game uh, had only conceded three times from corners this season. You know, they are quite a well-organized yeah. team. I think they're, they've now, they're now on five, uh, which is the same as us defensively from corners. So, you know, I, I don't think they're a team who are known for their vulnerability in this area. So the fact that we exploited it, those situations as, as well as we did mm. bodes quite well. So the second half, and we get some open play goals, lovely, delicious yeah. open play goals. I was sort of, I think I said on the live blog, I was like quite ready for a bit of a change. And I sort of mooted Martin Ali for Trossard as, as a potential change after about coming up on the hour mark and then just before the hour mark. Um, there was uh, the the goal from Leandro Trossard. So thankfully, nobody ever listens to anything I say or pays any attention to <laughs> any opinions that I might have because it's a very good goal, I think, because, um, you know, he hasn't scored. I don't think he was like November. Did he score against Burnley, something like that? And that was his last goal, you know? So he's been a while without a goal. And obviously, Martinelli too, and we'll talk about that. But uh, very, very nicely executed um, if it's a counter-attack, is it a counter-attack? I guess it is. But a very quick throw from David Raya after a, a Palace corner had been headed out. I think there was a, 
cross back in and Raya claimed it and immediately set Gabriel Jesus down the down the right hand side. Um, and from there, you know, we've seen Arsenal overcook those situations a little bit in in the last little while, haven't we? And uh, it's been a bit frustrating, but this time it was it was pretty clinical. Yes, and if I was looking for encouraging signs, I, I do think this is one of those instances. And there were a few in the game where there just seemed to be a little bit more freedom and instinctive play from Arsenal's attackers. And yeah, this was absolutely one. Uh, Jesus does well to cut it back. Great throwout from White Raya, by the way. And I think Arteta, when he celebrated, you know, a lot of that was directed at Raya. I think that's exactly the sort of thing he wants to see from him. Mm. And, I think when we scored at Fulham, in fact, it was a similar situation where he claimed the ball early and, and, and got it out early. Um, and I really liked the finish from Trossard. I know that uh, his form has been up and down, but I actually think he's one of the better finishers mm. in the group. And I think he showed that there. Yeah. Great step inside. It was one of those where you're going, Oof. Hope he hasn't sort of just made it easy for the defender, but the defender lost his footing, I think, and then the finish is the finish is excellent. And at that point it's, you know, that's game over. I think everyone was pretty confident. That two nil thing, you know, we've talked about that a bit this season where you're two nil, you you don't get that third goal, you don't give yourself the cushion and as poor as Palace were, as we know, it only takes a second. Uh, uh, you know, there were a couple of dangerous free kicks for Palace and maybe a set piece for them as well. And all of a sudden you're sort of biting your nails because rather than it being you know 3-0 or 4-0, it's back to 2-1 and, and we've, we've endured that a bit too often. So it was good to see that third goal and good to see that third goal um, because of what it meant for what Mikel Arteta could do with his substitutes from yeah. the sidelines. Um, I will say, by the way, when we scored that goal, there were people around me in the North Bank literally going, open play, open play. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. I think that there tells its own story. All right. Well, look, we got that 3-0. And then not long afterwards, I think there were a couple of changes. Um, let me just have a look at my... Smith Rowe was quite an early change, which was fe felt interesting, I guess, in the context of the discussion about him the previous day and reported interest from West Ham. Yeah. Yeah, 69 minutes, Martinelli and Smithrow on, Trossard and, and Havertz off. A big cheer for Emile Smithrow, who's, a, you know, who's a popular figure and somebody people want to see get a bit more playing time. So it was nice that the game state, as you, you talked about, allowed Arteta to feel confident enough to, to do that. I mean, I don't think it, those were risky changes or anything like that, but... Certainly, this is you know maybe the earliest Smith Rowe has got on this season, and and you know uh, Martinelli, I think, is the substitute that came away with the most from his um, from his appearance. But Smith Rowe came on tidy enough, got involved, didn't do anything particularly wrong, um, and hopefully that's a, a little bit of a confidence boost for him and for the manager in terms of you know how he feels he can use him and and what he feels he can contribute to the team. Yeah, I mean. It's a, it's a small thing coming on, you know, 10 minutes earlier, but it makes a big difference. I think it means he got more minutes in this game against Crystal Palace than he did in the entirety of December, pretty much. So I think hopefully that is indicative of him being in the manager's plans. You know, I'm always cautious when I hear things like this because training and competition are very different, but I have heard that he's training really well, that he feels very physically confident at this point in time, Smith Rowe. So yeah, it was great to see him and, and the fans were delighted. Where do you think the West Ham stuff came from the other day? I'm, I, I think from West Ham. I, I'm sure West Ham would love to take Emil Smith Rowe on loan. Uh, but certainly it was news, would have been news to him. And it was not something Arsenal were particularly prepared to entertain. I think, you know, my understanding is Arsenal don't want any significant first team player going out on loan at this point in time because mm -hmm. it doesn't do them any favours. No. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's unusual though. It's a bit of an odd one. You would think that, you know, it's something that the... the we've talked about this before, but with transfers, typically uh, the club who approach or make an offer will have that player on side by that point in time. Mm. Um, that clearly wasn't the situation here because... I think Smith Rowe's really determined to to try and make a real fist of breaking into the Arsenal first team, yeah. you know, between now and May. And 
Um, I think uh, he's he's very confident in his capacity to do that. I know he's quite a quiet boy, but he's got enormous self belief. And yeah, I think he thinks if he's given the opportunities, he has the quality to take them. So yeah, I, I, yeah. Listen, it, it made no sense, did it, from an Arsenal perspective? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, if if they come in with a big money offer, sure, that's and it. That's you know, different. Yeah, but they didn't. It, they didn't. If they'd said, "Here's." I don't know what, you know, 40 million pounds or something. And it means Arsenal can go and do something they want to do or bring forward something from the summer. Then that's a different conversation. But Mm -hmm. looking at January generally, you know, nobody's spending. No, I I, I think there's a lot of clubs treading very carefully. I think these profit and sustainability rules have got a lot of teams thinking a bit more cautiously than they might have done. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think we're seeing that in the wider market. So, yeah, I, I think he'll be staying, uh, certainly until the summer. And I think how much he plays between now and then will determine what happens in the summer window. Yep, I think that's I think that's entirely fair. Um, there were other subs, of course. Gabriel and Declan Rice came off. Mm. Declan Rice with a little bit of a hamstring strain. That was the worry there. Gabriel got a, a kick to the knee or something like that in, in the first half. Arteta said he was struggling a little bit with that. I mean, it seemed to me, I don't know whether you thought the same, but but Rice, if not playing within himself, certainly wasn't as all action as he he can be. Um, mm. Perhaps a little bit inhibited. I don't know if this was a hamstring strain that he had gone onto the pitch with or something he picked up during the game, but... Uh, yeah, who knows? I mean, let's hope it's nothing significant. I mean, a bit of hamstring tightness, you know, is not unusual for a player mm. to be feeling um, a strain or, yeah. Uh, let, uh, I, he may, might not have been at the top of his game, but I don't think he looked like a player who was injured as we kind of understand it, you know. So I'm hopeful that that is nothing too serious and grateful for a bit of a rest between now and the next game. Yeah, that's where I was talking about that, where it might be useful. You know, you you could make the argument that after a 5-0 win, bring on the next game and let's, you know, use the confidence uh, boost that we've got to go into that one. But if the break means we can get Gabrielle and Declan Rice fully fit or or ready anyway for the game against Forrest, then it might be be useful. I I must say, I, I liked... The changes. I mean, obviously, watching live in the stands, I didn't have the full context about Rice having a knock and Gabrielle having a knock and maybe not being 100%. But I liked the changes kind of irrespective of that. I liked giving Smith Rowe more minutes. I loved the idea of Martinelli coming off the bench. I actually liked the idea of giving Kivior some minutes in his actual position as a left-sided centre-half mm. and, you know, a bit of rehabilitation for him there maybe and, and making him feel included and part of the group because we're going to need him almost certainly between now and May. Um, you know, bringing Jesus off a little bit early, uh, I didn't mind either. So I liked the changes, but I think you hit the nail on the head earlier on when you said it's the game state that affords you the chance to make some of those. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, let's talk Martinelli then. A lot of discussion about him this season. Because of the the lack of end product, I think there's no other way of of really saying it. Um, I don't want to go in hard on him or anything, but compared to last season, he's not scoring um, with the same kind of frequency. Was it last week or the week before where we were asked to pick a player who was going to maybe come to life or whatever it was for yeah, for the second half of I the think season? You I think went Martinelli, didn't yeah, you? I think so. I think we both kind of went there and. Uh, this will be very useful for him, I have to say. You know, I know they were two goals against the Palace side who were beaten already, who were probably switched off defensively. Like, why are you playing a high line uh, at 3-0 up, you know? Um, yeah, the guy who was playing as their sort of right wing back, I think is ostensibly sort of more of a midfield player. He did not, he's only 20, so I, I don't have a go at him, but he did not have a good cameo. Yeah. Um, uh, but... You've got to finish them off. You know, you've got to take the chances. And that's exactly what we haven't been doing. Exactly. Uh, so I was really pleased. And, and actually, for that first goal, another nice little through pass from Eddie Nketiah. I think we yeah. saw one from him the other day, didn't we? Um, and yeah, plays in Martinelli, who did not look like a player out of form, 
you know, lack of goals, lack, loss, loss of confidence in those situations. No. Very, very composed. It was a great finish, but you know what? There was a moment maybe five or ten minutes after he came on and he had a – there were two moments, actually. There was one where he had a really good run. I think he ran it over – over the touchline and there was another one where he got into the box and just kind of left the ball behind him a bit and and Mm. got tackled and I was like oh come on we know you're better than this you know and and those were the sort of things that we've seen from him um this season where maybe just that final decision isn't there whether it's not instinct whether he's overthinking I don't quite know what it was. And I was looking at it going, oh, come on, you can do it. And then he gets those two goals. I mean, I think the first finish is is very good. The second one, it's a good pass from Eddie as well, by the way. And a yeah. Second assist for him in, in the last while because he did provide a, quite a similar pass for Kai Havertz to score the second against Brighton. Um, yeah, 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 indeed. Um, and then, of course, Martinelli, uh, second Ball through was from Jorginho this time over the top in behind. I mean, what else was he going to do? There was, you know, if you've scored one like that, you might as well just do it again. He's in the rhythm there. Yeah, he's in the rhythm there. And but, actually, but, yeah. his first goal I should mention as well. It came about from Saka coming back and taking the ball off Eze inside his own half, and to be doing that in whatever it was, the ninety third, ninety fourth minute was a, a credit to him. Mm. Um, yeah, they did put some gloss on it, but to be honest, they might be the most valuable moments for Arsenal in the game, those goals for Martinelli. If they can ignite him exactly, yeah, and send him on his way and have him looking more like the Martinelli of last season, then they're, they're, they could be very precious few moments for, for the team and for Mikel Arteta. So, yeah, delighted to see those. Um you could see a bit of relief, I think, etched on his face. I think he knows what that signifies. I mean, what did he do? Double his tally for the season? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. He had two goals in the Premier League up to Saturday, and now he's got four. And I think, you know, if you are looking for the silver linings, if you're looking for the positives from this game, as we've already mentioned, um, five goals, no no complaints. Um, mm. Clean sheet, um, just what the doctor ordered in that regard. But for players like Martinelli and Trossard as well, let's not forget. I think it's important for for Trossard to have to have got on the score sheet again as well after a, a period in which his form has been a little bit patchy too. You know, you're looking for you're looking for um, every bit of confidence boost you can get um, from a game like this. And you know, I wonder as well, what do you think? Does it mean anything? Um, that Arsenal are now so obviously good at set pieces and and corners and free kicks. Does that or could that have any impact on the way that that opposition teams set up against us? Is there something that we're going to have to, you know, keep working on to to remain as effective in in that regard? I think it's continue evolution. I mean, we spoke Mm. about the signals, but I think it's the same with the routines. Yeah. And again, it it might be partly why some people think open play is more sustainable because the patterns of what you do in set plays can be quite... uh, They're easier to analyse potentially and for other teams to get wise to. But, uh, you know, we've had that layoff. We've had that time in Dubai. Clearly, there's been some new stuff that they've worked on there. And I think, you know, we'll probably profit from that over the next few weeks. And while we wait for the league to catch up with us, then we'll have to innovate again. Yeah. And that's why I think Yeovil's role is so interesting and so demanding. I think the same is true for all aspects of our play, but analysis is now so good that you just have to keep on top and keep moving forward. Um, yeah, I mean, there has been quite a bit of variation with with definitely. our set pieces throughout the season. If you think about it, I think we're taking fewer short corners than we did last season. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think there were periods in this season where we've taken more as well, but certainly not at the weekend and no. not so much of late. Um, but but di- targeting different areas, whether that's to do with the opposition or to do with um, just mixing things up, I don't I don't quite know. If you remember the, the analysis of the Manchester United game, they were talking about how Arsenal were sending corner after corner to the back post because I guess that's where they saw United as being vulnerable and that turned out to be the case right at the end, wasn't it, when we got that goal Declan through Rice through Declan Rice. Gone, yeah. um, 
but we've seen Arsenal go near post quite a lot. I think we did that against Fulham, uh, whether it was entirely on purpose or just bad corners, I'm not 100% sure, but a lot of near post corners. I think there's more can go obviously wrong with a near post corner as well than than putting it in the mixer or putting it towards the back post. But, uh, you know, throughout the season, different takers, uh, different areas targeted, different movements. We saw obviously a very defined role for uh, for Leandro Trossard in this game. So I think it's within the capabilities of this this uh, coach and these players and this sort of setup to to keep things a little bit fresh in, in that regard because you know it's a it's a very valuable weapon for us that prowess at set pieces. Definitely, definitely, and. Uh, you mentioned Trossard scoring again and that being important. And I think it, it is. I had a look at sort of his numbers generally across the season. And I do have to say, although, you know, his performances might have dipped along with the rest of the attack in recent weeks, his pure numbers in terms of productivity, I think are pretty good. I mean, he's got the best minutes per goal ratio in the squad, 160 minutes per goal. It's comfortably the best mm. as well. I don't think there's anyone close to that. His goal conversion rate is 27%, which is the best in the squad. He's scoring basically half a goal a game or a goal every two games. Um, and yeah, it, it, I think that he's an interesting player because even if Martinelli is a more natural fit and suits the system better, I do think Trossard is a guy who makes things happen and does, you know, things do tend to attract themselves to him. You know, there is that kind of productive element to his game. And I think he'll have to be mm. integrated in the first team. It not, I'm not saying playing every week, but playing substantial minutes because, um, you know, he is a guy who's getting goals from open play. He's certainly not rising to nod corners in, you know. No. Um, and the numbers are decent, seven goals and two assists now. So, yeah, I mean, I'm interested to see how his role evolves uh, over the next few weeks. Yeah. And then you look at the you look at the squad in general. These are all competitions goals. You know, Saka yeah. is the leading scorer with 9, Trossard 7, Odegaard 7, Jesus 7, Eddie 6, Martinelli 6, Havertz 5, Rice on 3, Gabriel uh, with a couple. Uh, then you have Ben White, Reese Nelson, Saliba, Jorginho, uh, Zinchenko, Tommy Asu and Fabio Vieira. Uh, with one each, and only Kivior and, and Emil Smith Rowe of the the players who are regularly part of the first team haven't got a goal this season. Sure. You know, so look the discussion and debate about uh, the Arsenal's need for a striker, or a thirty goal, or a forty goal a season striker. You know, will will go on and on and on, and it'll go on until the summer, I'm sure. But I think the reality of our situation is that we are going to need these. Uh, players to share the goals around. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think at least we are set up in a way that, that makes that more likely. You know, we, we maybe need one or two to, to catch fire a bit in the second half of the season, but we also need the supporting cast to chip in as well. And I think um, there is the quality within that group to do that. Definitely. And, and players like Trossard, players like Eddie, you know, we need goals and assists from them. And I'll add Smith Rowe to that as yeah. well. You know, guys who aren't necessarily automatic uh, first choice picks, but can definitely contribute. And, and if we're to get anywhere near where we want to go this season, they'll have mm. to. All right. Well, look, let's, um, let's call quits on, on part one here. We've got some questions, which we will do now in a moment. So we'll be back with your questions and more in part two, right after this. Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer questions that you sent to us on Twitter at GunnarBlog and at Arsblog. Also on the Arsblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an Arsblog member on Patreon. I'm going to go first this morning, if that's okay. Of course. This question comes from... Well, I don't know who it comes from because I've lost it. Uh, oh, no, I found it now. A. Dante. On the Discord. I saw this quest very question myself. It was on my own list. Ed. Right. But for the benefit of the listener, please read it out. Maybe we should, maybe for the benefit of the listener, we'll do it telepathically. 
<laughs> that would make for great podcasting. No. no. Okay. Uh, A. Dante says, how high does Gabriel Magalhaes, Gabriel Magalhaes rank in terms of the best transfers we've made under Arteta? Very high. Very, very high. Because, well, William Saliba is pre Mikel Arteta. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Gabriel, I mean, the, the price was very reasonable, I think, uh, if, especially if you compare it to what a left footed centre half of his calibre costs in the market right now. Um, and he was the great age. He's really improved since he came to Arsenal. He seems to play every single game, touch wood. I think he's right up there. Mm. Do you agree? 100%. Yeah. I think he's been a brilliant signing. Absolutely brilliant signing. Uh, and if he was to go, you'd be talking a big profit, I think. That's the surest indicator, right, of a good signing. He's worth now easily two or three times what Arsenal paid for him. Mm -hmm. um, he's part of maybe the best central defensive pairing in the Premier League. And I think he maybe doesn't get enough credit for his part in that. Uh, and... I actually don't know if we have the William Saliba we have now, if it's not for Gabriel. I think having someone he knew from French football, someone who could speak a bit of French with him on and off the pitch, uh, someone who he had immediate chemistry with, who mm -hmm. was a natural fit alongside him, has been critical in integrating Saliba and um, you know, making him part of the club and part of the team. I, I, I can't speak highly enough for Gabriel. I think he's terrific. Yeah. Really, really good. I think it's it's worth remembering that, you know, he was 22, I think, when he joined yeah. the club, which is quite young for a central defender. He's had, a, you know, some moments here or there where, you know, uh, like every defender, uh, I think because defenders now are so under the microscope that maybe he, um, you know, sometimes people will say, well, he's a, he's been a weak link at times, which I really, really don't agree with at all. I think he's been pretty much a, a stalwart since he, uh, since he arrived. Um, consistent, good defender, good on the ball, attacking threat in the opposition box, you know, scores a lot of goals. How many goals has he got for Arsenal? Um, uh, around a, at least a, about a dozen, I think. Yeah, I'm just going to. Well, look that up now as we're talking. Had, had I saw a stat from James Benj, who I think said, oh, well, what was this? It was something like if his goal had been credited to him, uh, his second goal, that is, uh, then he would have either matched or beaten James Ward-Prowse as for the most goals from set-piece situations since Gabriel came into the league. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's Pretty got mad. he's got 13 Arsenal goals according to transfer market. Uh, right. 13 goals in 147 appearances. And I think the fact that he has made 147 appearances in uh, you know, three and a half seasons whatever it is um tells you just how consistent he has been and how consistently available he has been. You know, which is another key part of of how you assess a transfer and how good it has been this guy um the shades of granite shaka isn't there in in terms of um his availability which is uh, just so important i think he's been a brilliant signing what was he 24 million something like that yeah maybe rising to 27 and I'm, he's probably hit all those mm. triggers now to be honest because he's played so much football for us and yeah. but you know we wouldn't have any qualms about paying that full fee um given what he's contributed and you speak about fitness, that's something he works really hard on. Like he does a lot of kind of gym stuff, conditioning uh, inside the club and outside the club to make himself as physically dominant as he is and as consistently available mm. as he is. Um, and personally, I'll always have a soft spot for him because I was the first person to ever mention his name in connection with Arsenal in December 2019 and uh, six months later he turned up at the club very nearly ended differently he was incredibly close to joining Everton um, oh, I remember that yeah yeah I think he even maybe arrived there for a medical uh, but then with 
COVID and everything else, the move kind of got pushed back and didn't happen. Mm. And Arsenal were able to swoop in. Um, and thank goodness, because he's been he's been terrific. Thank goodness, and and I think he's got a tremendous shriek as well <laughs> when yeah. he when he's appealing a decision. He just has this very high pitched um, shriek that he lets out. Finally, we have replaced the Highbury Screamer. Yes, at last. At last, by a man on the pitch. So uh, <laughs> I, I approve of all of it. Yeah, he's great. Really great. Um, and, and one other thing, which is that one of the things Arteta's lamented in recent weeks is Arsenal not being good enough in both boxes. And I've said this before, but I can't think of many players who are as good in both boxes as Gabriel. Yeah, um, good point. He really does lend something at either end of the pitch. What about this from RT Parisi uh, off the back of our discussion about Trossard and Martinelli? They say, who would you start on left wing versus Nottingham Forest next week? Both players have a good argument to start. Uh, and when we've not given Trossard rewards for his good performances, he's tended to slowly fade away without consistent game time. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, that's, Trossard that's, has scored, started a game and scored. Martelli's scored twice. come off the bench and scored twice. Hmm. I mean, I guess it depends who Forrest are going to have at uh, right back. Don't they have a guy who's away at AFCON, their first choice? Uh, possibly. I think. Possibly. Um, I could be wrong. They've not played yet. Am I right in saying they've not played since uh, last year? Who? Forest, have they? No, they played on Saturday. They were beaten 3-2 by Brentford. Ah, right, you are. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Google Google foxed me there. Yeah. They were beaten 3-2 by a Neil Mopé goal, of all things. Mm. And an Ivan Tony goal. Um, yes. Which we'll so, have a chat about. So they played Montiel. At right back, Gonzalo Montiel. Mm. In fairness to us, it's almost impossible to keep track of who plays for Nottingham Forest these days. They have a squad of 9,000 players. Yeah. Um, so, yes, they played an Argentine, Gonzalo Montiel, who they brought in from Sevilla on loan. Mm. I mean, is it wrong to say I don't care? <laughs> it's not so much that I don't care. I'd be, you know, I'd be pretty comfortable with whichever decision Arteta went with. Yeah. Uh, the 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 ability to take someone like Martinelli off the bench is it's got to be slightly tempting. You've got to balance that with his desire to start games and there was a fitness issue I think which led to the decision uh, um, for the team against Palace, but I mean, one factor to consider in the selection for Forest is that we don't have a great big layoff after that. You know, we play Tuesday night and then Sunday is at home to Liverpool, right? One of our biggest mm. games of the season. So I think if there is any concern lingering over Martinelli, you probably save him for Liverpool. Yeah. I, I suspect. Maybe so. Maybe so. Do you think there's something to be said or is there anything to be said, you know, about Havertz and Martinelli and, and their connection or maybe lack of connection? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've spoken about that in the past. I think having Zinchenko back in helps that flank, yeah. you know, in possession. And there was some nice moments from Zinchenko in the game. I think before the first goal, he played this through ball. Oh uh, yeah, for Trossard. I mean, yeah, that should have been the corner. Should have been a goal actually when when they replayed it on match of the day. You know, they highlighted the run that Gabriel Jesus should have made. Right. Um, but he he sticked a bit or stuck a bit too close to to the defender. But the pass from Zinchenko was excellent. I thought he was good actually. Zinchenko defensively very solid. I know he wasn't tested too much, but um. You know, some of the incisiveness that he has with his passing uh, helped us control the game, even if it didn't, you know, spark us into like a five-star attacking performance. I think the control that we had over the game was in part because of the way he used the ball. 
Yeah, I, I just watched that pass again. It's amazing. It took like four players out of the game with it. But um, yeah, Havertz and Martinelli, maybe there's a, a question of compatibility there and maybe Trossard gives you a bit more fluidity. I, listen, I'm with you. I think that we also have to think about these games as 90-minute games and they'll both have a role to play in that, I'm sure. Um, quite who starts and who comes off the bench, I think will be informed by fitness and a tactical element, you know, who the defender is, how they defend, what's going to give them the most problems. Um, I will say if Martinelli's fully fit, I think he'll start. Against Forrest? Yeah, mm. I do. I do. Okay. Um, okay, okay, I mentioned him um, earlier. Strawberry underscore Jesus on the uh, Discord says, how do you feel about what Ivan Tony did? That kind of behaviour first game back makes me very, very cautious about him, even more than I was before. I think it's a bad look um, culturally as well. I don't know what that means. Maybe um, Does he mean the shifting the free kick? Yeah. I think so, yeah. I, I, I sort of think that's fair enough, isn't it? I mean, I, 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 I'm sure it happens all the time, but most of the time the ball doesn't end up in the net. I think it's on, got to be on the officials to spot that. I think players are kind of within their rights to try that sort of thing. It's not like he moved it six yards. Yeah, I'm sort of with you. Um, it, it's in the era of VAR. If there was a, if they haven't picked up on that, then. But but I also I have to be honest and say like I'm not sure that they should like. I, I've only seen it once or twice, but I feel like the advantage he gains is so slim and ultimately the opposition defence, it's kind of, you know, they can respond to it. There are things they could have done to maybe alert the referee. I, I just am not bothered about that. Yeah. I don't think I would be if it was scored against us either. I think there's still... I would have more questions about the badly positioned wall yeah, exactly. Yeah, the guy moving the ball a yard to one side. Yeah, same. Yeah, and, and, and as I say, I've just got this feeling that it must happen all the time. I mean, there's just no way that all free kicks are taken from the exact spot where the fence was committed. There's no way. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a couple of Gabriel Jesus questions. Yeah, I thought we might have a couple. Yeah, Jimmy Tex on the Discord said, any thoughts on Jesus turning into prime in Zaggy on Saturday? I think I counted five offsides, plus one where the cross didn't reach him. I was sitting in line for most of them. They were A, obvious, and B, frustrating, although he did do a lot of other good stuff. Do you think Mikel Arteta asked him to play a bit more traditionally and stay on the defender's shoulder more? And that he needs a bit of time to adapt, or am I just reading into coincidences? Um, so I answer that one first. I'll, I'll follow up with another. Not sure. It was something that fans in the ground were a little bit frustrated by. Um, yes, I was certainly aware of that. Uh, maybe it was about trying to stretch the Palace team uh, and you know give Arsenal a different dimension in behind that's a little bit less familiar to him. We know. He likes to come deep and join up and connect the play. We don't see him quite as often make those darting runs in behind. So that could have been it. I mean, did you, is it something you picked up on? I noticed it because it's unusual because he isn't usually that guy. I mean, no. most centre forwards will get caught offside once or twice a game, but the frequency with which he was being caught offside did, um, I did take note of that, but whether it was to do with just fine margins uh, or instruction as to how he's being asked to play. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think we'd have to see if it became more of a pattern, you know, across yeah. multiple games. What, what was your other Jesus question? The other Jesus question was from Pok de Pok Shamak, mm. who says, how many more goalless games from Jesus would it take before you want to give Eddie a run of starts again? Um, good question. I think quite, I think a few more. He's now without a goal in four appearances, I think. Uh, one of those was not a start. One of those he came on at Fulham. Um, clearly, I think he's not scoring enough goals. I, I think that's evident. What is it? Three in the Premier League. Uh, in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What is it? Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen appearances. Um, 
yeah, I, I think we need more from him. And, and when we spoke about players igniting in the second half of the season, he was kind of my pick just because I believe yeah. we need him to score more goals. And I think he should be scoring more goals. Um, but I do think, you know, you look at this game, he had an assist. Yes, Eddie had an assist. But I think Jesus is a better all-round player and I would be persisting with him. But I take the point, he ought to be scoring more than he is. I can't really add to that, to be honest, yeah. because my my first take is that I think all around Jesus is a better player than Eddie. He gives the team a bit more than Eddie, but you can't you can't make a good case for uh, him not to be scoring more goals. You know, he has to. He really does. He's a centre forward for Arsenal. He should be delivering a bit more in terms of end product. Um, good assist for Trossard. Very good break. But we do need him to score a few more goals. Um, but Certainly. It, and, and, you know, his numbers, his overall numbers are being bumped up by our Champions League group, in which he did really, really well. I mean, admittedly, some of those teams, you know, Sevilla in particular, having a disastrous season. Lens, Lons aren't what they were. Um, so there's a bit of mitigation there. It is striking when you look at his Premier League record, particularly, you know, that the goals aren't really happening for him regularly. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I don't think, this is the thing, I, I don't think anyone's expectations are that he become Haaland. I don't, I think that's an important thing to stress. I think even people who are sort of most frustrated with Jesus in front of goal aren't asking him to be a 30 goal a season player. I think if, if, if he was a 15 league goal a season player between 15 and 20, I think most people would say that's great. You know, he's one of the guys who's contributing at a high level, sharing the goals amongst themselves. We're not asking him to be the man. We just need him to be one of mm, the men. Exactly. Exactly. Um, um, and yeah, hopefully he can turn that corner soon. Um, what about this from San Quirico 44? Goodly morning. Didn't we seem more dangerous from open play when Jorginho came on? I love Declan Rice, but could our challenges in the final third be because we're missing parties' directness and Rice is just not that kind of player? I think we we're more dangerous because, as we mentioned in the in the first half of the show, Palace had you know been beaten. Yeah. They were playing a ridiculously high line. They changed personnel. They the changed back. personnel. They knew the game was up. So concentration levels, I think, lapsed. And that's to take nothing away from the goals that we scored, either the, the pass from Jorginho or the pass from Eddie and Ketty, and certainly not the finishes from Gabriel Martinelli. But when you score in, what is it, the 93rd and 95th minute, something mm -hmm. like that, 94 and 95, you know? That's a team that's just not paying any attention. Um, yeah. They're so, sprinting to read the placards in the away end uh, yeah. and to find out what that message is from the Crystal Palace fans. Yeah. Yeah. There was a question here actually from um, boom, 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 boom. Sal, uh, Sal T. Thierry Henry on the Discord, he said, seeing the Palace fans with their banners reminded me to appreciate it's been years since we regularly saw planes with messages flown over the stadium. So my question is, isn't that nice? Mm. Yeah, it is actually. Yeah. Nice to not be on the end of that. Um, as for the Jorginho Rice thing, listen, I do think there's a conversation about uh, whether it's sort of applies the handbrake slightly to our play that, you know, I think Partey is a more vertical passer than, than Declan Rice is. Mm. Um, Jorginho, I'm, I, I don't know so much. I mean, his passing was really good in that cameo uh, at the weekend, but I think he was playing a team who, like you say, had been beaten by that point in the match. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of something, <laughs> funnily enough, I think we'll only really be able to assess it if and when we ever get Partey back. Um, mm. Who knows, you know, when that might be. But, uh, you know, with Rice, there's so many attributes to his game and he does carry the ball forward very well. And I think he's more directed in that respect. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah. I, I, to be honest, I think it might be more a thing of Rice and Havertz. Like, I, I, I'm not convinced that Havertz is a great forward passer. I've said that before. I don't think he's brilliant at playing the ball, you know, between the lines. Um, I certainly think Shaka was better in that respect. And I think it might be that sort of combination, having two players who that's not necessarily their strong suit in the midfield. Maybe that has some sort of effect. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, he's a good passer of the ball, no question, Jorginho. But I, I can't make um, I can't make any real um, assessment based on the last few minutes against Crystal Palace. No, I, I have to say, I did think he might start the game. I, I liked, I quite liked what him and Rice did together against Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Um particularly in the first half. I, I quite enjoyed sort of seeing them in as that sort of uh, almost double pivot next to each other. Rice, you know, ostensibly playing the left eight, but actually playing quite close to Jorginho. And I think Havertz was up top, wasn't he? And he dropped in next to Odegaard at times. Um, I quite I thought that was quite promising. It wouldn't surprise me if we saw that again when we play Liverpool in a couple of weeks' time. But mm. I suppose maybe for at home to Crystal Palace, uh, Arteta didn't feel we necessarily needed all that security. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I thought this was... Oh, it's your question, actually. Sorry, man. Is it? I thought I'd... Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. This one comes from Icon X on Twitter, who's at Arsenal Icon X. And he said, is that the moment David Ryan needed to win over some of the crowd? And if it helps quell the discourse, will we see the benefits in the second half of the season? I think he's obviously referring to... The, the throw which led to uh, the third goal for Trossard? I think it will help him for sure. And and uh, I, I do feel for David Raya because I feel like he's he's been on a bit of a hiding to nothing, uh, particularly with the live crowd, you know, because I think Aaron Ramsdale so fondly thought of that it was always going to be difficult for him. But... I've seen a lot of people really excited about that distribution that he, he showed. Um, and and maybe it can be a turning point for him. I think, you know, doubling up with a clean sheet as well. I think it's it's overall one of his better showings. Um, and it's probably been a little while now since uh, like a howler that's cost us. Um so I, I think he's definitely going in the right direction. And obviously with us being out of the domestic cup competitions, mm. his place looks pretty secure. I mean, I think Aaron Ramsdale, should he remain with the club, as looks to be the case currently, he's probably looking at, what, a home game against Brentford? Um, mm-hmm. And that that might be it, unless there's a, an injury or severe drop in form. Um so, yeah, I, I think he's in a, a more stable position now. Is it what you need for the crowd? Maybe. We will see. Part of me feels like there might always be a bit of a reticence to fully embrace him while Aaron Ramsdale's still at the club. And probably the best thing for both of them is that they go their separate ways. But it could be a turning point. What's your feeling on it? Yeah, maybe. You know, it's a really good contribution smart goalkeeping, you know, decisive goalkeeping to come out and claim the cross and then to set the, the counter-attack going in, mm. in one movement. You do wonder if that is something that they've, you know, tried to work on as well during the during the break. Um, you know, the ability to stretch the opposition defences um, and the goalkeeper. Well, if you've got and, a keeper who's yeah. good at collect, coming and collecting, then theoretically, you know, that's an impetus for a counter-attack every time. Yeah, and he did try. There was a couple... Maybe there was at least one more where he tried a, a long kick, a quick long kick, which I, I don't know if it came off or not. But, you know, he does have the the distribution ability to be able to do that. So it's a good moment for him. I think, uh, you know, being involved in a goal, keeping a clean sheet, no drama. And, you know, the thing about, I don't know how connected it is, because it's probably a lot to do with the way we play this season. But despite the fact, you know, he's let in some goals and there have been a couple of moments here and there, he feels a lot less busy than Aaron Ramsdale did at times last season when, you know, we really needed Ramsdale to to make incredible saves and, and have big, big performances. Even in the season where uh, people would acknowledge this was maybe the best Arsenal football that we've seen for for X amount of time, the goalkeeper was still quite busy. 
Yeah, I mean, it was the anniversary of the North London Derby win the other day, and I saw a few compilations on social media of Ramsdale's performance that day. And, you know, what was it, six, seven, eight saves he's having to make? I don't think we've ever seen Raya really have to do that. No. Um, and I suppose that's where it gets really interesting. I, I have no doubt that Arsenal are a better team defensively this season. And I suppose the question is, like, to what extent do you credit Raya with that? So mm. is his ability to come and collect crosses or keep the ball in possession, suppressing shots and reducing the threat on our goal? Mm. Um I suspect it is, but quantifying exactly to what extent it is and how much impact it's having is very, very difficult. Yeah. But I think the Raya conversation has evolved at least. I feel like there's less of a who should play this week? Is it Raya? Is it Ramsdale? I think now the question is more, from what I'm observing among fans, is more, well, probably the ship has sailed on Aaron Ramsdale. Is David Raya the guy? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I think that's a more interesting discussion, to be honest. Yeah, I think it is. And I think it's one worth having. You know, clearly, I think clearly he is going to join Arsenal permanently. A lot of people say to me, why don't we just not do it? But I don't really think that's an option um, because of the nature of the agreement that was stu struck with Brentford. Mm. But uh, yeah, is that sufficient to get us to where we want to go? Uh, I don't know. And, the, and I think the next few months with Ryo in a slightly more stable environment will will tell us a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I'll do this one because I guess I, ha I, I, to be honest with you, Andrew, I'm doing this question. I'm asking you this question <laughs> because I have an answer for it. You've got a good answer, do you? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I just got something that I want to sort of, All right. it's a bit of a hobby horse. But Matt Taylor, um, I believe it's a, it's a different Matt Taylor to the one who uh, played wing back for Bolton. But uh, he says, goodly morning, gents. Eze for the left eight. So you've got, you've got an idea on this one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hang I, on, Andrew. Go on. The doorbell's gone. I've got to go. Oh. I'll, wait. Play the music. Will do. I'm back. All right. It was a delivery, uh, but I don't know what it is. <gasps> Can we have uh, like a live unboxing? We could, but I live in yeah. a flat and it's down by the front door. Right. It's okay. too much effort, Andrew. Okay. It's too no much problem. effort. I'll unbox no it. I'll let you know next week. It's good because we, we've trailed the next episode there. That'll keep people coming back. A cliffhanger. What's in the box? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Eze. Yes, what we were chatting about this on the Discord. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are a Patreon member, do join us on the Discord for nice conversations and fun times. But Crystal Palace, although they've been quite bad of late, have, in my opinion, three very good players who could all, maybe even by the end of the summer, be with kind of you know top six clubs in the Premier League. Um, Mark Gehi, uh, Michael Elise, and the aforementioned Eze. Mm -hmm. um, and genuinely, I think Arsenal should be looking at all of those players. I, I think they they all have the calibre to play for a, a club like ours. And I, I think I'm right in saying that Elise and Eze um, may have even been part of the academy at certain points. Elise you know. certainly was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so why not spend you know thirty or forty million uh, <laughs> bringing him back? But yeah, I think they're all really good. I think they're all really useful, and I think Eze could play um, in midfield for Arsenal. He, he's very technically accomplished, but he's also quite physical. Like I was really struck by that watching him the other day. He's mm. a big guy, quite broadly built. Um, Man City were interested in him quite seriously last summer, and I sort of have a suspicious feeling that they may come again for him next summer um Elise obviously is a kind of left-footed right winger well we could certainly do with another one of those and I think Mark Gay is someone that Arsenal have watched and admired for 
quite a long time, like a quite a cultured centre back, can play either side, um, can sort of perform different roles in about four as well. So yeah, I just think they're interesting collection of names mm. to, to bear in mind moving forward. Do, do, have any of them caught your eye? Oh yeah, Olise, Michael Olise, I, I absolutely love. I think yeah. you know the the hamstrings give me a bit of pause for thought. Hopefully, um, the problems he's having with them this season. I think the first hamstring injury is very serious, but hopefully he can get himself back to to full fitness. Like if you put me on the spot and and said, pick one, mm-hmm. I would pick Michael Olise. Sure, I think I probably would too, but I'd also have Eze in the conversation, and I like Mark Gay, and obviously that's the one we'll buy because he's a centre back. He's a defender, yeah. We don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. By anyone else, got to get more of those in at all times. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, I genuinely think like their situation. I mean, Palace presumably wouldn't want to lose three in a year, but if they were to really collapse this season and mm. go down, that could happen. And I, I honestly think they'll all kind of make their way to near the top of of English. Football. They're all good enough, you know, to play. Yeah. Um, with all due respect to, to Palace, for, for clubs in better shape than Palace are in right now, I think that's I think the, so. the, the best way of of putting it. And it might be a case that they have to, you know, move these guys on because they'll want to fulfill their own ambitions. It might be in some ways useful for Palace to get that money in and, and, and spend it well if they can spend it well. That, of course, is, is the big question. Um Let's do a couple of very quick ones to finish. Mary had a little Ramsdale on the Discord. Jonathan Pierce and his reaction to Gabriel Jesus going down theatrically in the box at 2 0. Did you listen to this on Match? I did hear that, yeah. Yeah, I'll just play it for people because, um, you know, he's a fairly well established commentator, but now appears to, I don't know. Did sort he, of the moral arbiter of yeah, English football. There's a sort of, did he have a, an overdose of sanctimonium? I don't know, but here's what he said on Match of the Day. Well, it's not a penalty, is it? And the way he flings himself down to the ground is not good for the game. Jeffrey Schlupp is probably just telling him that exact point. You're better than that, Gabriel Jesus. You're better than that. You're better than that. <sighs> yeah, I mean, listen, it's an odd uh, trait to have developed in your yeah. commentary, I guess, you know, he's big time now, Jonathan Pierce. I remember him way back when. Capital doing, Radio. Yeah. Capital uh, Radio. Do you, I remember in the 90s, we used to follow Arsenal games on an IRC channel run by a guy down in Australia, maybe two guys down in Australia. Wow. Right? And so it was just like a chat window, chat um, server thing. But you would get the games streaming live on Capital Radio on the internet because before, you know, back then there was not the, oh, there are rights issues with this. It was just Capital Radio or streaming live on the internet. And there was no such thing as geo-blocking and, and all that kind of stuff. So we yeah, used to get a lot of... Capital Gold. I, Capital I Gold, Jonathan yeah. Pierce so we used yeah. to get a lot of Jonathan Pierce back then. And his thing then was that he was like a shouter. I don't know if you remember. Yes. But he was sort of... You know, commentary was quite sort of staid at the time. It was kind of your Barry Davises and your John Motsons. And Jonathan Pierce would sort of lose his shit, basically. Yeah. That was kind of his gimmick. Um, and then he sort of transitioned to the BBC and now has sort of taken on a kind of like, a, almost like a guru persona. Mm. <laughs> it sort of dispenses moral wisdom uh, throughout the course of the 90 minutes. Wasn't it on, it was on... Capital Radio that he did the the Eric Cantona moment when Cantona jumped into the crowd at Crystal Palace. Did he? Yeah. I'm pretty sure there's there's like audio of him going, Oh my god, oh the humanity, how could anyone uh, something like that. I'm, I'm That's where it all started. I would say so. I would um, say so. But yeah, I mean listen, it was a dive and it was quite a bad dive, I thought. Yeah. Um but yeah, I didn't think it needed the kind of the layer, the obsequious layer of sort of uh, moral yeah. indignation. I think there are things that are actually much, much worse for the game that don't get the same kind of uh, attention. Mm. Maybe things that are systematic or, or you know, harder to Ivan express. Tony moving that ball a yard. Yeah, bastard. All right. <laughs> Eight-month ban. <laughs> 
<laughs> I say. For ball shifting. It's a new yeah. it's a new offense invented in the game. Um okay, final one. Uh Cobwebs three on the Discord. Goodly morning with Arsenal desperately searching for a new secret signal system for corners. That was harder to say than you think. What ideas do you have? And brilliantly, would they have worked if you hadn't shared them on a podcast? <laughs> Signal system for corners. I mean, wouldn't it be brilliant if, you know, the, the corner's about to be taken and Martin Odegaard is standing on the um, the edge of the box mm. and all of a sudden he whips out a top hat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're all looking and go, what the fuck is this? And then next time, Martin Odegaard is wearing a, a blue chrysanthemum in his yeah. lapel. Those yeah. kinds of Carrying things. Carrying a briefcase. <laughs> It's like, uh, what, like, what's that film with a uh, um, James Bond, Irish James Bond, Pierce Brosnan? Yeah, uh, not the talented Mister. What the fuck is it called? Oh, you know the one uh, about the art. He steals about art. The art guy. Yeah. Oh fuck! What the fuck is it called? Everyone's screaming it. I know um, they are. Uh, uh, I, I just went to Google and typed in James Bond, which is wrong. <laughs> Pierce, Pierce Brosnan, Brosnan, art thief. Uh, it's not Santa Mr. Thomas, Thomas Crown, Crown Affair. Thomas Crown Affair. So, like, next, all of a sudden, Arsenal have got a corner, and there's like eight Martin Odegaards all wearing top hats and carrying briefcases walking around. The opposition just don't, who am I marking? Which that one? Would good. That would be I'd awesome. Like that. Oh, I'd like it if he just sort of um, pulled a flute out of his sock and played like, <laughs> <laughs> like a little. Like like a little leprechaun or something, you know, and plays like a little <laughs> little whistly tune. Yeah. And that's the signal. Or, like, could we get them, you know, say at the clock end, we've got the Ashburton Army drummer. Could we get them involved? You know? So, like, they Specific what they bang beat, on the drum yeah. determines it. I don't know if we should be putting them in charge of big tactical decisions like that, but... <laughs> hey, they're willing to help. You know, it's good for the atmosphere. Yeah, they do they score goals. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, it's all good. Yeah, I like. I th- I think, I think the top hats would be nice. Mm. Yeah, touch cumbersome, but you know if you can make it happen. Uh, oh yeah, I, I, listen, I, I, it'll I work for a few it. weeks. Yeah, and then people will get onto it. That's the trouble. <laughs> All right, look, we had better leave it there uh, for now. Thank you very much as always for being with us and for listening. Do tune in next week where we might have an extra helping of. Arscast extra goodness for you so uh, stay tuned for that tomorrow we'll review the Premier League games in the 30 over on Patreon for now though take it easy folks and we will catch you on the next one bye bye